him. Can we do that real quick? Father, I just thank you, God, uh, for this awesome family, Rachel and Alan and God and their kids. You got all that they mean to us. And today, I pray, God, that you would give him a double portion of your anointing. God, that you would, you would rain down on him today like a waterfall of your presence into his life and into his heart this morning to speak to us, to give us knowledge, give us the word, Father God, that you have for us today. In Jesus' name. Now, Alan, listen, you didn't, I, I, I wasn't prepared except for the Lord hit me this morning as soon as I uh, entered the room, and he said that your family, um, all, all the things that your family's gone through, which no one really knows your story. They really don't. I mean, if they did, we'd be here all day just to hear, and it is, it is an exciting testimony. But I heard the Lord say that you're, that, that the man that God is restoring back is the man that has full integrity. You're a man after God's own heart. And this morning, I just hear God saying that, that he's restoring everything the enemy tried to steal from you. He's restoring it back, not just once more, but like double portion and tenfold. He's restoring everything back to you the enemy tried to steal from you. And I hear the Lord just saying that the, 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 what is the measure of a man, the measure of a man is a man of God who's full of integrity and peace and joy. And, the, and God is just giving you that this morning. Full of integrity, peace, and joy. That's the measure of a man, and that's who you are. Amen? Can we just give him a hand as he comes and shares the word of God? Amen. Oops. We did a no-no there. We had two mics on. I'm so sorry. Well, I can tell you that... Uh, Pastor Steve doesn't even understand how timely that that word is. Uh, you know, uh, I got to give you some disclaimers, first of all, before we start this. I'm really excited to share this with you, so I thank you for the opportunity. I thank Pastor Steve for sharing his pulpit with me today uh, and giving me this opportunity to share this word with you. Uh, but as I was praying, uh, I really feel like that this word, it's hugely important. Uh, you know, the title of today's sermon is going to be A Recipe for Renewal. Uh, you know... I think my wife's hoping that I'll respond to my altar call. Uh, you know, it's one of those type deals. She's out there laughing. Uh, but anyways, uh, there's three main words we're going to focus on. I'm not going to tell you what those are yet. But what I can tell you is, is that the purpose of this sermon is to bring us some encouragement. Uh, you know, I feel like that ever since COVID happened, the church, society, everything that we've known has been challenged. Everything that we've known has been abnormal. Uh, and we've all been through some changes and through some transformation. Uh, you know, and I know that for me personally, and this is what I want to share with you today, I'll tell you that within my own heart, I have plenty of things to work on, and I am far from being perfect. If you don't believe me, ask my wife and my children. I'm sure they could give you a list of grievances if you'd be willing to listen. Uh, you know, but what I can tell you is, is that with this, and what I want to share with you today is that I believe that Sometimes when things don't look the way we want them to, that when we go through a process of renewal, then just like the word Pastor Steve shared, if you only knew how timely, and as you see this, and as you see the slides, and you see what's coming, you're going to be like, oh, wow, you're going to think that we studied together. Uh, I didn't share with Sister Teresa what I was preaching about. Uh, something just told me not to, and it was like God just wanted to show me, but it was like she was listening to my praise and worship praise set as I was prepping this sermon. Uh, you know, because th that's the thing we have to remember at the heart of the sermon is that God is always faithful. Okay, he's always going to be there. He's always going to do those things. And that's the angle that I have to look at that today as we start to look at a recipe for renewal. And I feel like that as we age, for some of us who are getting older, I'm in my mid-40s now, uh, you know, some say that's not that old. But then I've had a couple of instances this week that reminded me that I'm starting to get a few years underneath my belt. Uh, you know, I was talking to some people at work, and we were talking about deer whistlers. Who remembers deer whistlers? See, some of them are like, I'm not telling you because I'm not dating myself. I'm not joining that club. You know, and then I was like, what? You don't remember deer whistlers? They're like, no. And I'm like, why well, had a Dodge Omni with those on it? And just saying that you had a Dodge Omni alone kind of dated you and put you in a certain era of car back when they were boxy and kind of ugly. But, uh, you know, so then... I was sitting at the house, and my daughter, she's in the middle of changing jobs right now, and she was just complaining about some, you know, meaningless things and being the typical sarcastic uh, Alan that I am. 
you know, I said, you know why, kid? Maybe I should go in my backpack in there. I had some change. Maybe I should get you a quarter. She's like, quarter? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I could get you a quarter. And, you know, I'm thinking in my head, like, give you a quarter so you can call somebody who cares. And the wife looks over at me, and she's like, babe, she's never seen a pay phone. <laughs> I was like... Ow, like gut shot, okay? So, uh, you know, I wanted to share those few funny things with you because, you know, sometimes things can be feel old as our bodies feel worn, okay? But I want this sermon and our spirits to bring us to a point of renewal, to a point of rejuvenation, okay? Uh, go on ahead and take us over here to uh, Isaiah, please. I'm going to try and make this thing here work for us. Uh, I will share another disclaimer with you. Uh, this is my first time to ever preach with some of the forbidden fruit on the stage. Uh, I know this church is hugely into apple, uh, you know, so we're going to try this. We'll see how it goes. Uh, please give me some grace if I fold this thing in half and it finds itself laying in the parking lot at some point. But I probably have the only Apple device on the planet that's loaded plumb full of Google and Amazon stuff. So nonetheless, we'll give it a shot and see where it goes. All right, so the first thing I want to talk to you about, back up one slide for me, please. I'm sorry. I'm going to make this hard for you today, but I'll try and keep you there. The first thing I want to talk to you about is waiting, okay? Now, I know for me to stand here and preach to you about waiting, this is going to be a self-challenge, okay? Because one thing I can promise you is I am not a very patient person, okay? That is not one of my strong points, and waiting is not something that I enjoy, okay? Now, I know all of us have experienced some kind of waiting at one point or another, how many of you here are married? You've all waited, okay? How many Browns fans do I have in the house? You're still waiting for Baker Mayfield to be an elite quarterback, okay? Uh, you know, how many of you have been to Cedar Point for all my young people? So then you've waited, okay? Now, I want to say that because just in case you want to judge me and think that I'm impatient, all those things that we just had a little laugh about when we talk about waiting are things that are kind of painful, okay? Waiting doesn't seem like a fun thing to have to do, okay? Especially when we live in a society that has taught us in a fast food generation that we can roll through the drive through and get whatever we want. We can have it right now. We can put everything at our fingertips. We never want to wait. Our computers are faster. Our tablets are faster. Our phones, which we're not going to date me again because I'm not even going to talk about some of those old phones, okay? They're faster, okay? But I feel like that with all of us with our expectations getting faster and faster and we want it now and we want more at the tip of our fingertips that all of a sudden we forget what it means to wait, okay? But there's some importance in waiting. And go on ahead and take us over to that slide uh, with the scripture here for Isaiah chapter 40. Verses 30 and 31, because here it says, Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Okay, now as I was studying for this, and I got to tell you, some of you are going to want to beat me up because the first thing that come to mind was I remember back in the day, I grew up in the Church of God. How many of you are some old school Church of Godders around here? Uh, do you remember the old cassette tape with the eagle thing and the Indian? Do you remember that? Believe it or not, that's not true. It doesn't really happen. Uh, <laughs> I was kind of disappointed because I was hoping to share that, and then I did some research. And believe it or not, the oldest eagle in captivity or in the wild is 32 years old. Uh, an eagle doesn't get to a point of where it gets to the end of its life at 32, and then it has to be rejuvenated and beat its beak against the thing. It's a really awesome story. It's really motivational, uh, but it doesn't really happen in real life. So I want to share that with you because some people then have used this story that we've heard shared in churches and across time to try and attack the Bible and attack church, okay? However, we're going to understand this the way that it was written, and I'm going to share with you the real part of it because there's actually an important part of this that this scripture is referring to. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. There we go. Because what this scripture is actually referring to is the process of molting in an eagle, Okay, now how many of you have ever owned any kind of birds? Chickens, birds, okay? And how many of you know that they have to molt? Okay, now see, this is important for an eagle because an eagle is an apex predator, okay? It hunts. 
it fights. It, it kills what it eats, okay? Now, over time, you know, that's not easy, okay? Over time, its feathers get worn. Sometimes its feathers get tattered. Sometimes they'll get torn. Sometimes they'll have little nicks in them. But see, the thing that becomes important about that is that when these feathers get tattered or torn and the eagle, he's flying, he's flying high, and he swoops in to capture his prey, when those feathers are tattered or torn or they're imperfect, they begin to sometimes get to a point that they'll whistle when he travels through the air. Now see, of course, part of the hunt is that he has to be silent. Part of the hunt is, is that he needs to be able to not announce to his prey that he's coming. So what we have to understand is that the importance here is that when an eagle has to go through molting, the, the, the people who wrote this in Hebrew, the Israelites, the way that they seen it was that they felt like it was the eagle going back to a young point or a young stage because the old feathers would be shed away and then the new feathers would begin to grow or to groom. Now, for those of us who have owned any kind of birds, how many know that molting is a really ugly process? Okay? When a bird molts, it could be the prettiest bird in your hen house, and while it is molting, it will probably be one of the ugliest birds that you have in your hen house. And the bird becomes moody, the bird becomes different. The way that it lays eggs, its eggs production even decreases because during this time of rejuvenation, its body has to go through what it does. And see, when the, when the Lord was showing me this and relating this molting process, and I was understanding this scripture the way that it is, Pastor Steve, I couldn't help but to feel like that so many times when we look in the mirror ourselves, we'll say, you know what, wow, that's really ugly right now. Wow, that's not the way that, that I want to see myself or that's not the way that I want other people to see me. Okay, but yet at the same time, we don't see ourselves the way that he sees us. Because see, he knows the road ahead. He knows where it is that he's going to take us to. And, and see, that's where the, when I began to see that and I began to attach that, it just, it began to settle into my spirit and it began to excite me because I thought, you know what, God, I might not have done this the perfect way. I might have made mistakes along the way. I might have not done this the exact way you would have me to do it. But you know what? Due to your grace and due to your forgiveness, I know that you're going to begin to pluck those old feathers from me one at a time. I know that right now I might not be the most swift or the most silent. I might not be the most well-polished. But I know that when I'm done and you have rejuvenated me and you've renewed my spirit, then I know that I'll become what you made me to be. And I know that I'll stand and I'll shine like the perfect bird and the perfect creature that you made for me to be. And church, I feel like that if we can just capture that, if we can hold on to that, it'll radically change how we are and how that we interface with waiting. Because see, now all of a sudden, the thing with waiting is that it's hard because we know what's coming, but sometimes you just can't see it. But the thing that I want to bring out to us too is that while we're waiting... We're still eating. And, and God said that to me while I was studying, and I was like, well, Lord, you know, what are you saying Like while we're, while, we're, while we're waiting, we're eating? Because I feel like that sometimes, and I'll be the first to admit that, okay, since COVID and all this has happened, work's gone crazy, okay? I mean, I have worked 676 and a half hours of overtime year to date. If you stack that up in 40-hour work weeks, that's over four months of extra work. I've done this year alone. If you don't believe me, I can show you on my pay stub. Okay, but here's the thing. I begin to feel convicted because in order for me to spend that kind of time there, I haven't been spending the time with the Father, spending the time in prayer, the time in rejuvenation that I need to spend to prepare myself to follow my calling and pursue what I need. And see, I feel like that some of us have to be honest with ourselves because you know what? We come to a point that we've allowed a pandemic, we've allowed all these things to give us the excuses, we've allowed it to bring us to a point that we've stopped eating. Because see, the thing is, is that Scripture tells us here, if we go to Matthew 4, 4, it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So see, that's the problem is that, yeah, you might make more money, you might eat well, I can eat steaks every day if I want to. I made an extra 50% of my salary to this point of the year right now. But guess what? If I'm not eating his word, if I'm not receiving what I need to receive, if I'm not 
here with my church family, if I'm not here getting what I need to get, then I can never grow. I can never become that which he wants me to be. Amen. And church, I feel like that what God was telling me was that, you know, if we want to be a strong church, if we want to be a strong individual and be what God called us to be, we have to come to a point that we're willing to ditch the excuses. We have to be to a point where we're willing to take the crutches and shed them away. And listen, I'm not yelling at you. I'm jumping on myself here today. And I'm hoping that this word, as I share it with you, I really believe it's going to be for somebody other than myself. Because I'm telling you, we've, I feel like so many of us have allowed ourselves to just become apathetic and to allow things to happen that we shouldn't. But John 6, 27, here it says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you, for on Him God the Father has set His seal. So don't follow my words. Listen to His word. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to Me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in Me shall never thirst. So the thing is, is that what we have to find out is that our worst moment in ourself can become our best moment through him. And think about that for a second. Because I really want that to strike and stick home. Because see, that's the thing, is that all of our, all of our self, our righteousness, is filthy rags. We've heard that a thousand times since we've grown up. And, and as you'll see today, I was actually laughing at myself. There's probably five different translations of the Bible in this sermon. I ran all over the place with it, which is so funny because when you grew up in church and you hear things, if you only knew how many scriptures I had memorized, in King's James Version, and I read them in other versions, and it gets me all messed up, and it's all wonky. So some of my favorite passages, some of my staple scriptures that I stand on in my life are in this sermon in totally wild, like, whoo, crazy translations. But see, I felt like that the reason God did that is that it's about stretching. Because see, there comes a time where that we got to get outside the comfort zone. It comes to a point to where that where we are isn't good enough anymore. And see, that's the thing, is that while we wait, we're going to go on ahead and skip ahead here. I'm sorry, buddy. I'm making this really hard for you, okay? Um, we're going to go to John 5, verses 1 through 6. And it says here, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Now, some of you probably already know where this is going. For then an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Now listen, I had probably one of the most prominent visions I've ever had. I think I even wrote you or called you about it afterwards. So this sermon started a long time ago. Uh, and I was sitting right back there in the back, right about where Jason's at, maybe a row behind there. But God showed me through the eyes of the man waiting at the pool of Bethesda. But not only did I see it, Okay, and let me tell you, when I watched, like, it was like I was there, okay? Like, to such a degree that I seen the beauty of the angel, I seen the wing tip, and I seen the wing touch the water, I seen the sprays, this is how detailed it was, Alan, I seen the sprays of water coming up off of the water, and I felt, as I looked through this man's eyes, I felt with everything in me, the anticipation and the expectation that he had. So what we have to imagine is here this man is, he's seen other people make it into the water. And it says that his condition was 38 years old. We don't know how many of those years he spent at the pool exactly. But here he is waiting at this pool, seeing other people get their healing, seeing other people get escalated, seeing other people come and get what he was wanting for himself. But he stays and he waits now, I don't know how many of you are sarcastic like I am, but can you imagine when you've been waiting all this time and this guy says, do you want to be made well? Now, the first thoughts in my head are, no, I'm just sitting here because I'm bored. Like, you know, I had nothing better to do, you know, 
me and Pastor Steve would probably have fishing poles, hoping there's fish in there. But, uh, you know, nonetheless, that's all I could think. You know, because then you're thinking. But see, here's the thing is that why does he ask that question? Because see, sometimes that's what we have to understand is that it, it has to go beyond just what we know and it has to come to a point to where we have to speak into existence those things which are not. Because see, that's why that he asked him because he had to speak from his mouth and to say, yes, okay, yes, I want to be made well. Because see, one of the definitions that I want to look at, I'm going to back up, I did this out of order, I'm sorry, is that a definition for waiting is to remain stationary in readiness or in expectation. So think about that for a second, because see, here he was, the man sitting there at the well, he was at a point of readiness, he was at a point of expectation, he knew what he wanted, he knew what God could do, he knew that healing was not just possible, but then also, it goes on in the dictionary, I'm Old Webster here, he agreed with my sermon great today, and, and in uh, definition B, it says, to be ready and to be available. And in John 5, 7, it goes on to say that the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps before me. Then Jesus said to him, not, well, better luck next time. Okay, he doesn't say, oh, just stick with it. There's always a better day. No, instead Jesus looks at him and he speaks to him and he says, stand up, pick up your sleeping mat and you will walk. Now, now listen to me, church, because here's the thing is that sometimes when we're waiting, it's not the answer that we thought we were waiting for. So this man has a choice. Okay, I mean, imagine this. You've invested all these years, possibly 10, 20, 15 years, waiting for a certain thing to happen, and now somebody shows up halfway and questions your intelligence, okay? And after you feel like they questioned your intelligence, now they're telling you to do something totally radical and different. Okay, now what I couldn't help but see and what God showed me was that there had to be a certain amount of recognition in the man sitting there waiting that he knew the Son of God when he seen him. So sometimes, church, what we have to do is we have to come to a point that we're willing to take the blinders off and that we're willing to look outside of our own will or outside of our own passion so that when God does speak to us and he tells us what to do, that we're willing to move instantly and to be obedient because our faith is going to drive us there and take us there. Because that's genuine expectation. It's not enough just to sit and to wait. And I want to say that because in this sermon, that's what I said, like, yeah, waiting's terrible, it's horrible. But see, that's the thing is that if we just sit and we're just ready, you could be just like the contents of these jars. As long as they sit here and they never move, these jars are designed to stay sealed. They're designed to keep the contents inside good, but if we never use them, what good are they? And no, I'm not going to throw this down and break it because then I'm going to have to sleep on Pastor Steve's couch for a few days because I promised these would make it home. These really came out of the kitchen. In fact, we're going to sit it down before we mess this up. Thanks, babe. Okay, so, but what I'm trying to say is, is that, you know, you can be ready, you can be present, but just being ready and just being present isn't enough because, see, it's going to require action. Waiting requires action because if you're just sitting around waiting, and, and I'll, I'll share this with you. I'm imperfect. I don't care, Pastor Steve. Pastor Steve's like, Alan, this is, we're going to shove him off the end of the schedule forever. Okay. When he first wrote me and he said, Pastor Alan, do you want to preach next week? I didn't write him back for 24 hours. <laughs> I really did it. Because I was like, I was actually looking for every excuse not to. I'm like, man, he knows I'm on vacation. I'm like, but it's youth deer gun season. My boys are wanting to hunt that weekend. I'm gonna have to spend time in sermon prep and slides and all this stuff in the middle of deer gun season. Do I really wanna do this? I'm just being honest. I told you I'm not perfect. So we're just gonna, if you had some crazy image of me, we're gonna trash can that today, okay? <laughs> I'm molting, my feathers are ugly. <laughs> Okay, all right? But here's what I'm saying is that 
That's not what God called me to be. Yes, he wants me to be a good father. Yes, he wants me to spend time with my children. Yes, he wants me to work my job and do it to my best and have all diligence about it and do exactly what the state of Ohio pays me to do. And sometimes that's ugly. Okay, but what I'm saying is, is that in the midst of all those things, he still wants me to keep my eyes focused and be ready for action when he tells me to go and tells me to move. Because he called me to be something better than I'm capable of being within myself. Okay, because church, that's the thing. If we take the gifts that he gives us, if we take the gifts of the Spirit and we just bottle them up and we cage them and we contain them and just to say that we have them and then we set those things on the shelf and we don't operate in those gifts and we don't operate in them and we don't do what God called us to do, then all of a sudden waiting doesn't become waiting because see, when we're waiting, we have an expectation of something better. When we're waiting, we're ready and prepared for the growth. We're ready for the maturity. We're moving forward. We're still feeding ourselves. Do you get what I'm saying? But if we don't do that, all of a sudden we become stagnant. When we become stagnant, then all of a sudden distance grows between us and God. Gifts become unpolished. Ministries fall by the wayside. And on this last slide for this section, it says here, waiting done correctly is not cruel and unusual punishment, but rejuvenation. And I really want to share that point with you because you know what? It's not. I mean, it, it can seem hard. It can seem uncomfortable. But it's rejuvenation. It's rebuilding. It's moving forward. The second word I want for us to focus on we could probably say is sometimes just as hard as it is to wait. Because the next thing that we have to do in the second, the second you know, ingredient for this recipe for renewal that I felt like God laid on my heart this week was trust. Because think about this for a moment. We're going to go back to the man laying there at the pool. Like we said, some guy just walks up. Some random stranger. And when that guy says that you have to just pick up your mat and walk when you've been crippled for 38 years, that took some trust. And see, that's the thing is that, you know, every single one of us here carries some dollar bills or some change in our pocket that have coins that have been minted, and every single one of them says what on them? And who do we trust? It says, and God, that we trust. But yeah, I feel like that as a nation... We've betrayed that. I won't say that as a church we have betrayed that, but as individuals in many aspects of our lives, we have come to a point that we have betrayed that. Because, see, that's the thing, is that when we can wait, in order to accurately wait, you're going to have to be able to trust. Because you know that that expectation... You know what's coming. You know that it's something better. You know that it's going to be renewal. You know that it's going to be rejuvenation. And you're going to keep hearing me say those words, but I hope that they stick with us today. Because, see, let me tell you something. Like, I really believe wholeheartedly that if I tried to design myself the way that I feel that God would want for me to design, I would screw it up. I mean, seriously. And see, that's the, that's the beauty of it, is that when God comes in, He's not looking to give you the credit. He's not looking to give me the credit. He's looking to bring glory to the Father. And see, the Bible tells us here, well, actually, we're going to back up. We're going to go with Webster again, okay? His definition of trust is an assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. And see, I love that. Because think about that. How many times can we say in our life that we genuinely rely upon God? And think about that for a second. You depend on your car to get you to work. You depend on your job to make sure that your bills are paid. You depend on that card 
that says you have benefits when you go to the doctor's office. But see, I'm going to share another aspect of one of the challenges that I personally had to face coming to this sermon this week, okay? I told you, it's been, it's been a rough one. This, like I said, my wife's hoping I respond to my own altar call because it's been a fun week. All right? Starting Thursday or Friday? Thursday night, really, I think. I worked a double. My stomach started hurting something fierce. I asked Rachel, like, hey, did you get mad at me and put some x lax in my food? Like, did I upset you? It was terrible. Couldn't hold anything down. Everything went through. Pastor Steve writes to me. He can verify this. This isn't made up. He's still good for Sunday. I think he could kind of feel that, like, I was really trying to get out of this if I could. And I'm not going to lie to you. The human side of you shows up and it says, hey, man, you're sick. You could just tell Pastor Steve your stomach hurts, and he can't get mad at you for that. You've got the easy out. Oh, everybody's COVID scared. You tell them that, you know, that your stomach hurts, it's over. He's going to want you to quarantine for two weeks. <laughs> I can make my vacation longer. Okay, so I mean, but I'm sharing this with you to say that I had to make a choice. The choice became that all those songs that you heard this morning started getting played in my ears all night long. I had to stand in my living room and to raise my hands and to pray and to say, you know what, God, I know that you're faithful. I was like, I know that if I can show up there Sunday morning, I don't care if it was bad the whole way there. I know that if I stood in that pulpit, that you're going to deliver me and give me the health and to give me what I need in order to stand in front of those people and bring the word. And what I can tell you is that in my years of ministry that my personal experience is, is that when we get fought the most, it's usually when we've got something that we really need to share and that we know that somebody else needs. So this, this word, it might not be for any of you, and maybe it's a public proclamation for me to tell you what I'm going to start engaging in my life and start changing because I know that I need to make some changes and to shift my focus. But I'm hoping that as we move forward that some of you also will want to begin to focus what your priorities are. Because the Bible tells us that, you know, that we will, basically our treasures is where that your heart will be. In Psalm 37, 3 through 7 here it says, Trust in the Lord and do good, then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. See, I felt like that that was important when we understand trusting and waiting because it's easy to look and see what somebody else is doing. You see it right in front of you. You see that it seems like they got everything going right. Things are great. But then for you, let's be honest, it's discouraging when your feathers are ugly. You can see them. That never changes. But when you see you, uh, but see, that's the thing is that we have to be patient. Because it tells us here in God's word, it comes, how many of us believe that God's word never comes back to him void? Amen. And that's why I packed this plum full of scripture today. And it's a little bit of a different style, I'm sorry. But I'm telling you, like, this is God's word. It's not Alan's word. I'm not asking you to listen to me today. All I am is a vessel to come here and tell you what he shared with me, what he told me I needed to do, and I felt like I needed to share that with you. It is what it is. Can't change it. If you get mad, go home and pray. You can tell him about it. <laughs> Just saying. Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. Now listen, these are some of my favorite scriptures, and I'm going to read them in the Passion Translation. Okay, I can quote these to you backwards, frontwards, forward. You can ask my wife. Prisoners come up and ask me all the time at work. They say, what's one of your favorite scriptures? And this is one of them. Okay, because I know that tribulation forms perseverance. Perseverance forms character and character hope. Okay, I told you, I know these frontwards and backwards. But it reads a little bit different in this. And when I read it and God led me to this, I was like, you know what? 
This is what he wants to share today. And here it says, but that's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence. We have a what? A joyful confidence. Because see, I feel like that that's the thing is like, I'm not going to downplay mental health. I'm not going to downplay anything else, okay? But what I am going to say is that we live in a culture that wants us to embrace things such as depression. We live in a culture that wants us to embrace things, that it's okay to be blue and that it's okay to be down, okay? It doesn't mean that tribulation ever looks pretty. It, I didn't stand here and tell you that molting ever looks pretty. But what I'm telling you is, is that if you have trust, in him, if you have faith in him, he's proven himself to be faithful. If you mean the words of the songs that you stood here and sang with Sister Teresa this morning, okay, then you already know what's going to happen, okay? Which means that if you genuinely know that you know that you know that you know that you're deliverer, okay? And see, that's where it becomes important. And what I love about the children of Israel was that they actually gave different names to God because that's the way that they engaged with him at that struggle. That's the way they engaged with him at that point in time. So when you know that you need your deliverer, when you know to call upon your Jehovah Nisi, okay, when you know that, you know, that you're going to have your banner, you know, when you know that you're going to call for God and you're going to call on the names of God, you're going to find joy in it. It doesn't mean that the struggle has to be a struggle. Many times when the struggle is a struggle, it's because we're not willing to share it with him because we don't think that he wants to carry that burden for us. Nobody's shoulders are bigger than his. So when it becomes so discouraging that you don't know how to move forward, it's time to get into some prayer. It's time to get into some fasting. It's time to bring yourself to a point to reflect and to look upwards and to know where that your hope and your future lies. Knowing that our pressures will develop us patient endurance. And see, we've got to understand this because not only can we find joy in it, but what we have to understand is that, I mean, who in here loves going through trials and tribulations? Come on, somebody, because I would love to bring you some of mine. You can take care of them, right? They're hard. Okay? How many of you in here have a diamond on your finger right now? Do you understand what it takes to make a diamond? A lot of pressure. Which means the hardest, the toughest, the most desirable, the most beautiful stone on the planet had to endure a whole lot of pressure. And think about that for a second because how many of you in here have felt the pressures of life and felt like that you can't handle it, but yet God's in the middle of making a diamond? Because see, that's the thing about, patience endur about patient endurance is that it forms character. Anybody can pretend to be something. Let me tell you that. I believe that wholeheartedly. Anybody can pretend for a time period or for a little bit, this, that, or the other. But your character, that's not something that you fake. Your character is who that you really are. And I don't, this version doesn't, I guess it does go on about character. And patient endurance will refine our character. I'm skipping ahead of it. Improving character leads us what? Back to hope. See, that's the beauty of it because we know that our hope lies where? In Him. And listen, I'm not trying to simplify your problems today, okay? And I'm not trying to tell you that when it seems overwhelming and you just first hit your knees that everything goes away and everything's hunky-dory and it's all rainbows and fluffy cotton candy, Okay? Probably not going to happen that way. What I can tell you is, is that when you come to God continually, when you genuinely turn those problems over to Him, to genuinely deal with them, not the way that the world teaches you to, not the way that your friends tell you to, not the way that people expect you to, that then and only then are you free in Him to begin to move and to begin to take care of those things which can begin to make change. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And I really felt like that when I read that too, to say, 
Are you really letting the Holy Spirit live in you? Are you walking in the Spirit? It's one thing to say we are, but then there's so many times that I think that if we're honest with ourselves that we don't. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, self-control. Pastor preached about these with the kids. And it's not a coconut. I had to say that. It's a song. But for those that know it, they got the joke. And it's like, we hear those things, but I feel like that we're at a point where the church is going to have to either be the church, we're going to have to be real Christians, or we're nothing more than a mere social club. And I thought about that. You know, when somebody says, you're a Pentecostal, do you find shame in it? Or are you proud to say, Yes, I believe that I can lay hands on you and that the sick will recover. Yes, I believe that by your stripes you are healed. Because see, if you really believe those things, and this is another sermon on down the road, sometime if Pastor Steve ever lets me preach again, he might say bye-bye. Uh, you know, I'm telling you, faith requires some kind of action. The third ingredient it's yearning. We have a slide for it somewhere. There we go. According to Webster's, the definition of to yearn is to long persistently to feel tenderness or compassion. Because see, here's one thing that I thought about with when we go through our challenges and we go through our struggles and we're waiting is that sometimes, and we're going to go back to the man sitting at the well, okay? What if his heart would have been, man, you let me sit here for 20 years before you showed up and did something? Really? 20 years? 30 years? However long it was? Because like we said, we don't know. But it was a long time. You let me sit here for all this time with all this faith and you finally show up and do it this easy? I didn't have to even get tossed in a, in a pool? And as I thought about that, I was like, you know what? How many times are we missing the blessing or the joy that's supposed to come from our transformation because we got wrapped up in selfish expectations and we got wrapped up so much in ourself that we let our heart become hardened. Because see, that's where that when I read this, that's why it meant so much to me, was it says to feel a tenderness or a compassion. Because see, that's what it's supposed to do, is that when we come to that point that we're yearning, it's because we have true desire. Because our heart becomes on fire. So now, all of a sudden, it's, it's not just being in His presence, it's a desire for His presence that's unquenchable, a thirst that can be filled no other way. So now, all of a sudden, the waiting, the transformation, the trust that's built drives us to a point of a deeper love and to a deeper relationship that we can't have any other way. How many of you here have been married for over a decade? Do you remember when you first got with your spouse and you said, I can't imagine that I'll ever love you any more than I do right now. But believe me, after a decade of her putting up with the ugly bird, with the rough feathers, she earned some respect. She learned a deeper level, she earned a deeper level of love. Because see, then all of a sudden, all that experience, everything that happened, the good, the bad, the ugly, takes us to a point to give us a, a new, renewed version of passion. And that's what I felt like with this that God wanted to say to us. We're going to read from Psalm 73, verses 23 through 28, because here it says, Those who desert him will perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. Ah, that was backwards. 
oh well, I like that part of it right there. We're going to leave it there. We make mistakes. It's fine. But see, that's the thing is that we find our shelter in him. Now I have to be true to my word and break the iPad and throw it in the parking lot. Uh, that is why we would never give up, though. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, here it says, that is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are what? Being renewed every day. And see, I think that that's important. Okay, because every single day, this isn't a one-time thing. Okay, we don't reach a plateau. Everything's great, everything's fine, and we stay there. Because see, that's the thing, just like the eagle will continue to go through challenges. Our feathers will continue to get nicked. Yes, we might have regrown them this time. Yes, we might have some new feathers. Yes, we might have replaced some of those old busted ones like we talked about. But guess what? There will come a time that the feathers will get another nick. But see, that's the beauty of it is that when we're talking about this yearning part and talking about passion, is that it's that continued process of the nicks and God delivering us and God continuing to rejuvenate us, continuing to cover us with his grace, continuing to give us his mercy that continues to make our love grow even more. It just grows in our dependency. It grows in what our expectation is. Because see, how many people here know that sometimes our expectations start at one point for God, but then our experiences and the things that we see in the mighty acts of God drive us to where our expectations change or that they're different. Think about that. How many things in life have you done for the first time? Remember when you rode a bike? Remember the fear of saying, what if I crash? What if I bust my noggin? What if I knock my teeth out? But then you rode a bike and you continued to ride. We've probably all crashed a time or two. All right? But it's just like that because, see, that's what happens with God is that sometimes he's going to push you outside your comfort zone. We talked about stretching. He's going to stretch you as to what's that next thing that he's going to take you to. Not where you want to go during the waiting, but what is it he's going to take you to? Does he take you to the grocery store and give you a word for a total random stranger? And then you go, oh, my gosh, I'm in my pajamas. I can't do this right now. I didn't fix my hair. I didn't do my makeup. What we have to understand is he doesn't care about any of that. And can you imagine the total stranger? You don't know what they've been waiting for. Maybe they're the man sitting next to the pool of Bethesda waiting for an answer from God. Maybe they're the one waiting for their miracle. Maybe they're the one waiting for God to show up and do something radically different. And you're the instrument or you're the one and it's your time to step into your call and to do what God called you to do so that radical things cannot just happen in your life but so that you can begin to affect the lives of others. So we don't look at our troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will be soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last when? Forever. If we can all stand. I didn't keep everybody too long. I have no idea what time it is. I got lost in that a little bit. But if we can all just close our eyes, what I want us to do is I want each of us to just take a moment to reflect and say, you know what? Do a personal evaluation on yourself and be honest. To say, you know what? Am I doing what God asked me to do? My spiritual goals. Are they aligned with what he's called me to do? Or are they aligned with where he wants me to be in his kingdom? And if the answer to that is no, then I feel like God's reaching out to every single one of us here to say, you know what? I'm a God that's greater than all that you know. I'm a God that's here to help you shine. And that today is the day to make a change. You see, that's the awesome part about it is that 
we can radically mess up everything that he has for us. We can do it all the wrong way, but it's never too late. Nothing's ever too ugly. There's no bird that goes through the molting process that God can't fix. There's no feather that can't be replaced. Because I, I mean, I feel deep inside of me today that, that there's people here that have gotten to a point that you just want to give up. The price of the struggle seems unsurmountable. And you just get to a point that you want to say, you know what? It isn't worth it anymore. And if you're here today and that's where you're at, I want to tell you, I believe in everything in me. God sent me here to tell you that there's a better day tomorrow. He has something for you. That he'll never leave you alone. Even when you couldn't feel him, that he was there. That his love for you never diminished, it never wavered. His belief in what you could be or what you could become has never changed. And if that's you, I just want to encourage you to come down here and to pray with us. be obedient with what I felt earlier, Absolutely. if that's okay. Um, I just felt like the Lord had just kind of <clears throat> brought to my mind some circumstances that a lot of us in the room have gone through, specifically those of us that may have um, shepherding gifts on our lives, um, uh, prophetic giftings on our lives, um, callings to walk maybe a different path than, than some others in the room. And I, I feel like sometimes the, the most powerful anointed leaders have been through the biggest, ugliest messes in their life. And I, that's been my experience personally. It's been my observation over the years. Because once you've been broken and God restores and renews you, there's a greater power and there's a greater anointing that comes upon your life, a greater grace because you've experienced what you've been preaching about. <laughs> and it's like you really, now I know it because I know it because I walked through it. And I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And he has come in and he has taken me to greener pastures. And uh, I, I know without bringing any examples to the room that just about everyone in this room that's called to be a shepherd has gone through some very devastating things even as of late. And uh, I felt like God reminded me that what we had as expectations in our heart oftentimes is not his expectation. And so when things happen differently than we expect, we fall into a place of despair and disappointment, yet it's actually exactly where he wanted us to be. And so I felt, and if, if we can do this as a room, I don't know who all God had this design for today. It's an applicable word for everyone in this room. But I felt like God's saying that specifically is for some of the shepherds that are in this room that are walking through healing and renewing processes. And what a reminder that even when things don't go the way we expect, and it wasn't easy, and it was very hard and heartbreaking that God is truly a redeemer and he's still in the middle of all that. And his gifts are without repentance. They're still in you. Amen. 
And he's not taking them back. He's just trying to help us walk through the brokenness and come to healing. So I know without calling them out, um, I would love for anyone in here um, that has that calling on their life. And sorry, I'm going to call your name. Pastor Odom, Steve, Chris, and Brittany, um, Alan, and Rachel. I would love for us to pray specifically over the ministers in this room, uh, Pastor Alan. Um, some of them are currently walking through tough times. Listen, I believe that the enemy has come to try to steal, kill, and destroy, but he has not won. Amen. And he will not win. Amen. And this is a house of healing. This is a house of restoration. And so we're going to declare that over them today. If you guys would come, there's no judgment. There's no pointing anyone out. But I believe that the enemy tries to put a, 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 a gag on our mouth. And he tries to, works to paralyze us through uh, circumstances of life. And I believe that God um, had just kind of hit me and said, we need to fight back against that today. Because there is no weapon that's been formed against any of us. And if we all stood up here and told our stories, yours is no worse than mine and mine's no worse than yours. And it's all been some ugly minutes and some ugly moments. And there is none of us that are better uh, but guess what? God qualifies us and redeems. The, he uses those moments to qualify us for something more. And he uses those experiences to take us deeper. And that's exactly what he desires to do. And that's why it's so wonderful that no matter what we've done, that he still extends that grace and, and is patient with our process and doesn't remove that calling and gifting on our lives. So um, are you okay with that? Any ministers in the room? Come on up, gang. And anyone else that would love to surround them and pray over them. If you need to pray for yourself, altar is still open. But I want to declare life and wholeness and restoration over those that the enemy has tried to take out. There's been war going on over their hearts and minds and souls, and y'all, some of you don't even know. You don't even know, do they? You don't even know, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we know. God knows exactly where they're at. He knows exactly where they've been, and he knows exactly where he desires to take them to. Guess what? We'll never get there. We'll never get to a there spot. We're already there. You're already in it. No matter what it looks like right now, you're still in it. He hasn't forgotten about you. He has not left you. There is still life ahead no matter where you're at at this moment. There is still hope. He is still going to use your mouth to speak. He is going to bring you out of the moments of darkness, and there will be more light than you ever had before. Will you believe that with me today? And church, let's just stretch your hands forward. I want you to declare life over their minds, their emotions, their souls, their processes. We declare that victory is yours in the name of Jesus. I pray that no weapon that has been formed or lifted against them, against them will prosper. In the name of Jesus, your name is victory, God. And whatever the weapon is, God, you will turn it around for the good. Father, for those that love you, God, for those that commit their path to you, God, Father, you will turn it for your good and you will restore and redeem, Lord God. You will provide what we need, Lord God, just one step at a time, God. One day at a time, God, we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. God, we thank you, Father, that we can trade in the sorrows. Lord God, we can trade in the sickness. We can trade in the disappointment, Lord God. Lord, we can know that morning is coming, God. We can know that when we're walking through the valley, Lord God, that you are taking us to a mountain, Lord God, to a green greener pastures lord god we can know father god that you are with us lord god whether we have left you or not father you are with us you are fighting for us lord god in the name of jesus that your giftings and callings are without repentance 
that you will not lift your hand just because we have failed you, Lord God. I pray that our turn back to you would be swift and it would be quick, Lord God, and you would accelerate the giftings of those here, Father. Lord, in the name of Jesus, because your hand is faithful and it is powerful, Lord God. And there is work to be done in the earth, Lord God. Lord, I pray that there is nothing wasted, God. That there is nothing wasted. Every tough moment, every leader that may have spoken ill words over them, Lord God, no moment will be wasted in the name of Jesus. Every state mistake that may have been made, God, nothing will be wasted because you are a redeemer. You are making all things new. All things new. God, so we declare, Father, that they are called. We reaffirm that they are called by you, God. We reaffirm, God, that they are forgiven by you, God. We reaffirm, Lord God, that they are provided for by you, God. We reaffirm that they are healed by you, God. In their hearts and in their minds and in their souls, God. And as their souls prosper, Lord, everything else will follow, God. We seek you first, God. And all the other things, Lord God, will come. All the other things will come. We realign and allow you to realign us, God. We allow you to realign us, God. We say yes to the process. And we say yes to how you've designed it, Father. We say yes. We, you have never turned down a broken or contrite heart, Lord. Never. And God, we lift our brokenness to you, God. And we say it's yours. Use it for your glory, God. Use it for your glory. Father, use it for your glory. That your name would be made known in the earth, Father. That there would be glory, God, that would come of it. That our families would be restored to full health, God. That our finances would reflect your glory. Our health would reflect your glory. That our tongues would prophesy, God, and declare healing, Father. Lord, where we are weak, Father, make us strong. Let the dead things die. Let the dead things die and let the new things come. Let the new things come. Thank you, God, that you don't waste a moment. Thank you, God, that you don't waste a moment, Lord. And I thank you for the bright and beautiful future and plan that you have for each one standing here, God. I thank you that you are delivering them. I thank you that when they are crying out to you that you are hearing them. And I thank you, Lord God, that you are minding them that it's okay to not be the amazing person that they thought they were because you're working it out. And it's okay, but we got to take a step, take a step forward, take a step forward, God, and you will meet them there. And you are meeting them there, God, and you are restoring and remaking all things, God. Lord, and it is beautiful. How beautiful are the feet, God, of those that bring the good news. How beautiful are the feet standing before us, God. God, of those that bring your word, Lord God, and those that have that calling on their life, God, to open their mouth and release you in this earth, Father. We call them beautiful. God, and we call the mess beautiful. Because out of all the ashes, you're bringing beauty. Out of all the ashes, you're bringing beauty. And it's your word, and we stand upon it, and we believe it, and we declare it over our lives, over our callings, over our hearts, and over our families. And never mind what that dirty old enemy tried to do. Never mind what the dirty old enemy tried to do. And we might have fallen for the trick, but guess what? The gig is up. The gig is up. And it's exposed for what it is and for what it was. And man is not God. And God does not lie. And God does not disappoint. And so we will not allow the enemy through man who has disappointed us to foil the future that you have planned for us, God. 
We call them healed, favored, anointed. God, and to, let today be a page, God, where we turn the page and we really rest. We rest in it, God. And we rest in it and let it be what it is and let you do it how you want to do it and let it take as long as it's got to take and let it look like you want it to look like God. God has some things for you standing here that are going to blow your minds. And that doesn't mean it's, I'm not talking about numbers of people, and I'm not talking about big buildings. I'm talking about he's going to blow your mind how he turns things around for you. He's going to blow your mind because he's not done with any of us yet. He's not done with one of us yet. <laughs> and he's so much bigger than our mess and, and our disappointment. So what the enemy, let's, let's let it be said today, and if you all would agree, what the enemy meant for evil God's going to turn it for good. <laughs> Come on, now let that faith rise up. What the enemy meant to tear you down and to tell you it's all over, God's going to turn it around for good. And that doesn't mean you have to hide from the past. That means you're going to build on the past. And he's going to make you stronger because of it. The mess will make you stronger. So I say thank you, God, for the mess. Thank you for the hard lessons. Thank you for making me stronger through the mess. Thank God. Amen. Amen. That was a right on time word for me. You know, you don't you don't always get reactions like you think, you know, you want them to, right? You want people to come down here to the altar and just cry their whole heart out and get everything out and renew their whole heart and, and the altar is just full. The tougher stuff is done inside that we carry with us. The work that God did here in this moment was ordained and why you had to go through so much pain this past week. It's just all frivolous, right? I mean, pain is pain like we, like whatever, I don't get to go hunting. You know how many times I've turned down a fishing trip? <clears throat> My boat sat in the dock for weeks when I had things to do. Y'all are so patient to just stay here with us for just a few minutes. I want you to see this picture. Please stay. Eric, are you there? Can you put that picture up on the screen? Is it ready? Be impatient with Eric. There you go. <clears throat> this is a picture that my wife took as we were leaving Kelly's Island one day. And I, I was thinking about how amazing God is and how great he paints pictures every single day. I'm a sunset guy. My wife's always like, how many sunsets can you, can you see? And I was like, every single one of them is different. So I always want to go on a sunset cruise. If you've ever been up at the lake with me, I'm always like, let's go on the boat right before sunset. And God painted that picture and he reminded me this morning that he owns it all. Whatever you're facing, whatever you've been through, whatever, whoever has stolen things from you, whatever direction you thought you should have went but you didn't go and you ended up here, God has a purpose yes. for your pain. In your pain. He didn't cause it, but he has a purpose through it. Yeah. And uh, man, you're so on point today, Tree. I just, I so appreciate you just being obedient. She's an amazing woman of God. She's my amazing woman of God. And I'm so blessed for that. The second thing is this. I believe that the, the word that you gave today, albeit you thought you delivered it in a semi-mediocre way, it was so on point. 
The scriptures that you read this morning were life-changing. And if we apply them to our lives, it will forever change us. Matter of fact, if you will just put up Romans chapter 5, the New Living Translation version that he put up there. In verse 7, the Bible says in that translation, it says that, that his love would cascade over our heart. And that his spirit would be in us. You see that? Is it up there? No. Never mind. We're cool. Is it good? All right, great. He's trying to find it in the 45 slides that he had. <laughs> Which were good. They were really good slides. But I don't know about you, but I just want his love to just keep cascading over that. That word cascading, that it's an action. It's it, he is he's constantly washing over our mess with his love. He's just showering us with his love. And I don't know about you, but I need to feel that more and more every single day. I I just do. This version of me is called the molting version. But I I'm, I'm just going to tell you something. I am going to stand here and say this prophetically. I'm I'm looking into the camera. The word that you gave today is the word for next year. So whatever you've dealt through this year and last year, whatever you've been through, the word that you gave today is a prophetic word for this body for next year, and that's renewal. The word that you gave is a prophetic, it's a prophetic word for our families are going to be renewed, our lives are going to be renewed. The renewal, that molting, the taking down, that's a prophetic word for us we, don't, we may not look like what we're supposed to look like on the outside, but surely God is working on the inside. Let the inside then come to the outside. God loves us from the inside out, not the outside in. Aren't you thankful for that? I mean, aren't you really thankful for that? Amen. Amen. Let's pray, and then we can go. And then I just want to uh, invite you back tonight. Uh, be here tonight at 7 o'clock. Try to come early. The house is going to be pretty packed, so I want you to get here early. Bring a friend. Uh, if we have to break out chairs, Travis said he's ready. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day and this beautiful word. God, this transforming word. Thank you for Pastor Allen's obedience to speak into my life this morning. Thank you, God, that you spoke to him in the middle of all his busyness. You spoke to him. And thank you, God, for bringing that word to us today, that, God, we don't have to be sitting and just waiting. We can just get up because you said, get up and be healed. Get up and be healed and walk. And, God, I just pray that we all get up this week. We all get up this, this afternoon. We get up. And we are healed and made whole. God, in the waiting, we don't just sit there. In the waiting, in the waiting, we hear your voice. In the waiting, we, we are renewed. In the waiting, there is a renewal. Thank you, God, for this service. Thank you, God, for all those that are not in this room that are joining us online. I just pray for them right now, God, that you would just meet their needs. According, God, not just to your riches, because you own everything. God, let us be reminded that your spirit is everywhere and ever present. Move in that hospital bed. Move in that living room. Move in that bedroom. God, wherever they're at, move and touch them. Make them whole today. Thank you for making us whole today, Lord, through this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We want to just remind you tonight to be here at 7 o'clock. For those that are joining us online, we will be streaming it live. So we want to make sure you're here. God bless you. We hope to